Today we're going to talk uh, with a client, Alberto, uh, who is a Vietnam veteran. And in this particular case, we're going to see an interaction between a Hispanic therapist and a Hispanic client who strongly identifies as a Mexican, not as a Mexican-American. Important to know that we do not mean to imply in any of these trainings that in order to be an effective therapist or clinical social worker with a Hispanic client that you need to be Hispanic. Not at all. What we're contending in our training is that to be a good therapist and to be a good practitioner with any other group requires that you be culturally competent and to some extent, we hope, linguistically competent in the culture and the context of that particular person's uh, culture and orientation. In this case, we'll see some interesting features because not only is he a Hispanic male, but he's also a veteran and he's a decorated veteran. So there's another cultural theme that permeates this particular case, which is that he is a person who was raised uh, in Hispanic culture, but has strong identification with himself as a former military officer and as a veteran. Um, Alberto has been asked by some of his friends in a church group that he belongs to, to come into uh, being evaluated and possibly treated uh, because his behavior has been changing over the last few months. Some of the uh, precipitating events may be that his wife died seven months ago, which of course we know is associated with grief and loss. And so he's been uh, experiencing the consequences of that loss. Um, but to aggravate uh, the situation, just a few weeks ago, his companion uh, animal, a dog, uh, also passed away. Uh, so he's had uh, a couple of, of grief-related um, incidents in the, in, the, in the near past. Um, so the, the, the folks at his church noticed, noticed that he'd become more socially isolated. And um, when he came in for his initial evaluation, and now we're going to go into the second session, not the initial workup uh, by, the, by the intake uh, social worker, who did all of the confidentiality clarifications about what it is that had been, uh, are his protections. Uh, the, the intake social worker noticed that uh, he had reported that his, his drinking had increased over the past few months to the point that he was isolating himself socially and drinking alone, uh, which we always know in, in clinical work is, is, is something uh, to be concerned about. Uh, Alberto is 65 years old. He was born um, in Mexico, uh, but is a, he was a U.S. citizen he, with his parents, migrated to the United States as a youth, um, and uh, he attended a uh, inner city school here in El Paso uh, called Bowie High School. Um, for those of you from not from El Paso, it's a classic uh, inner city school, highly um, uh, minority uh, represented and is only a few blocks from the border. And um, this is in an area of town called Segundo Barrio, which is one of the most historic uh, parts of our, of our city in that it is a long-standing community for migrants from Mexico and is a platform for migrants from Mexico and people born here in El Paso, Americans of Hispanic origin, to move on upward and forward in society from uh, their more humble upbringing in that context. Uh, he himself, uh, growing up in Segundo Barrio, faced all of the challenges that youth face in such an environment. Nonetheless, he did not join a gang. Uh, he did not become uh, involved in some of the things that people stereotype uh, Hispanic barrios about. Indeed, uh, quite the contrary, he graduated from Bowie High School in the upper half of his class, was uh, a very good student, and knowing that uh, his opportunities were probably pretty limited, uh, given the employment prospects of a, of a, of a young man uh, in the 1960s, uh, he joined the Army, uh, rather than being drafted, because of course at that time that was a very real possibility. So he joined the Army and uh, quickly advanced uh, in a non-commissioned role um, as a non-commissioned officer, uh, rising to first sergeant, uh, where he was a heli Huey helicopter repair person. Uh, he was deployed to uh, Vietnam and served in Vietnam uh, behind, the, behind the front line 
as a technician and only saw traumatic events indirectly, that is through the people that were coming in on the Hueys and going into the medevac hospitals and so on. Uh, however, because of his aptitude, he was identified for uh, early career promotion to a warrant officer and was sent to flight school in the United States and, and became a, a, a chief warrant officer, eventually retiring as a chief warrant officer for. What's important to this case um, is that he experienced a, a series of traumatic events in Vietnam. Uh, one of the most traumatic events was where he was on a, on a, in a landing zone, as they say, attempting to load injured uh, combat uh, soldiers onto the aircraft and he received fire at the aircraft Several of the men that he was attempting to load into the, into the aircraft were shot. He got out of the aircraft to assist in the loading. Uh, he himself took fire. He got back into the helicopter. Uh, he noticed that his co-pilot had been shot in the head and was dead, and he attempted to take the aircraft off. The aircraft failed, and he crashed at the, at the, at the, at the scene. Uh, he was rescued along with his, his uh, fellow soldiers um, by medevac. But that event, having seen all of these men killed in combat and then having seen his co-pilot shot in the head, uh, was very traumatic. That being said, he went on to a successful career after the Vietnam era and uh, continued to serve with distinction for 20 years. He also has uh, received a number of uh, combat-related uh, medals. All of this is detailed in the case study that is available on this module so that you can learn a, bit, a little bit more about uh, Alberto. Uh, after uh, grad, uh, getting out of the Army, uh, he, he had a career uh, in helicopter uh, maintenance and repair, but for our purposes now, he's retired. And during retirement, he has uh, experienced a lot of the things that people who uh, retire experience, and that is increasing social isolation and the, the, the challenge of finding meaning absent uh, ongoing and, and productive labor. Over the past few months, his intake worker said that uh, he, uh, he had complained of a loss of appetite, significant change in his sleeping patterns. He sensed that he didn't feel himself anymore. Um, he, he, his, his affect was, uh, was quite flat uh, and depressed, and he used the word that he feels really weak and doesn't feel so much like a man like he used to. Um, the preliminary assessment made by the intake uh, worker uh, was that he has a chronic post-traumatic stress disorder, but that we're now uh, looking at an acute depressive episode. So he has been for, referred to Dr. Sam Terrazas, who's a licensed clinical social worker and clinical supervisor, um, a master uh, clinician who's going to uh, take on the role in this next session of his uh, clin clinician. So I'll turn it over to them. Come on in. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Yes, Mr. Garza. Very nice Dr. to meet you. Yes. Pleasure Please meeting. take a seat. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Can I get you some water or coffee or anything? No, no, no. I'm good, thank you. Yeah, okay, great. Um, what side of town did you come from? What side of town? Yeah. Uh, Central. Okay. So was the traffic okay? The traffic was a little bit... Uh, Hectic, but not too bad. Yeah, yeah, they're doing a lot of they're doing a lot of construction on the yeah. Construction, yeah, it's making a mess several places. Yeah, yeah, it gets frustrating. Did you have any trouble finding the place? Mm, not really. They had told me more or less where it was. So okay, great. I was able to walk right over here. Yeah. Okay, great, great, great. Um, so I, I noticed it would look like it was going to rain this morning. It wasn't raining when you came through, yeah. It looked like it was going to rain, but it didn't. It was just you know wind and dust, like oh, usual. Right. <laughs> yeah. that, that's good. That's good because that does complicate things when we get we get going, particularly on ten, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. how long have you been in El Paso? Oh, most of my life actually, except for time that I've been in the military. Oh, I see. You know, I was always a. This has always been my hometown. I've always been a, an El Paso boy, so and most of my life I've been here. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. How long did you? How much time did you spend in the military? Oh, I spent quite a few years. Quite a few years. Uh, eight years uh, active duty, and then I did some uh, reserve time as well. So. I see. Wow. Very admirable. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit is just sort of how this works. Um, you were referred 
over here and I got some information about you. So yeah. I have kind of a heads up of like what's going on. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. Okay. And um, we've already talked about confidentiality, the intake. So yeah. I don't. We're, we're not going to go into a lot. So a great deal about that. But you, so you understand the limits of confidentiality. Yeah. yeah they told me all about that. Okay. Okay. So if you have any questions at that point, just let me know about that. Okay. So, um, so tell me, you're retired. Yes. Um, how long have you been retired? I've been retired since so far. So it's been it's been oh. a while now. Yeah. Oh, I see. Eleven years. Going on eleven years. I see. So what did you what do you spend your time doing? Uh, today, actually, today. Well, just in general. I mean, since you've been retired, have you found other employment? Well, I I have been doing a lot of volunteer work. Oh, know, okay. And uh, I had been spending a lot of time with uh, people at church and what have you. Oh, okay. But uh, I I kind of I kind of stopped doing that, and right now I'm not doing much of anything. You know. Um, I used to spend a lot of time with my dog, but he's, he oh. died a couple weeks ago. Oh, I'm so. sorry to hear that. What was your dog's name? It, it is, I just called him Puppy. He, oh, was, he was just a mutt, but he, he meant a lot to me. Yeah. Sure, I understand. Yeah, understand. I spent a lot of time with him, you know, grooming him and walking him and all of that. And, uh, and now that he's gone, there's, there's really nothing to do during the day. I watch a lot of TV, eat a lot of TV dinners, drink a few beers. I don't even work on the garden much anymore. You know. So, if you said about two weeks ago, puppy passed yeah, away. Yeah. So it sounds like puppy was very important to you. Well, he was because that's that's kind of all I had left uh, after my wife died. Oh, I see. Um, and and uh, he kind of kept me kept me busy, kept me occupied. Um, so now that he's gone, I don't do much of anything. I see. I see. And your wife passed away some time ago, from what I read. Yeah, right? two years ago, yeah. So you've had some significant losses over the last several years. Well, yeah. The, the, the most important person in my life was my wife. You know, she... Uh, we, I, I come from the bottom. I don't know if you, if you know about that. But, and, and I've always identified with the body. I grew up in the Second War. And um, when, I, when I retired, and even while I was still working after I left the military, my wife and I spent a lot of time helping out. Well, see. Down at the party, we did a lot of work with the people at Lafayette over there. Okay. okay. Help with the uh, the uh, the church and the convent they have down there. And uh, and when when she passed away, well, you know, I, I I haven't felt much like doing that anymore. You know, I don't have the I don't have the will or the say, the strength, you know, uh, to, to do that. So. It sounds like um, you and your wife were, were the, the barrio and your history there was really important to you and you wanted to get back, I presume. And yeah, it, it, it was um, because uh, I remember, you know, when I, when I was a kid, uh, there was a lot of bad stuff going on in the barrio. I had two older brothers and and they kind of kept the peace in our neighborhood, you know? Really? And, yeah. And I still have a lot of distant cousins there. And, you know, my mother was the old-fashioned type, and she would take in even some of my friends that that uh, didn't have a good home, didn't have enough to eat and what have She would take them in for long periods of time. So we st I st my heart is kind of still there. Well, that's so, uh, so, not, you're, so who you are as a person, your identity really is part of the barrio. Um, you still have family there, it sounds like. Always was, always was. Can, yes. can you tell me more about what that is? Because I'm, you know, I'm not from El Paso in particular, so I know about it, but I certainly don't have the insight that you would have about what that would mean. Yeah, well, you know, when, when I still had my dad, my, my dad passed away when I was in my teens, but when I still had my dad, he, he taught us a lot of important things. He taught us the old way, you know. He would give us a coscorron if we didn't <laughs> listen, or my grandma would give us a pellizco or something. Uh, but uh, they taught us uh, to, to take care of family, to take care of friends, take care of each other. And my, my older brothers did that for me down in the barrio, and then I kind of passed it on to younger kids. And um, that kind of stays with you wherever you go. I even took that when I was in the army, you know. Mm. and. Uh, it really helped a lot because those, those are pretty good 
those are pretty good uh, values to live by. Yeah. So it sounds like the familia, the familia is really important, respect is really important, and that translated in other parts of your life. Yeah, yeah, you gotta you gotta do what's right. Especially you gotta start with your family, mm -hmm. uh, your friends, and and, and, and your relatives, uh, and that kind of that kind of uh, uh, takes takes you a, a long way. That helps you. Uh, like in the military to respect authority and to get along with your buddies and that sort of thing. So, and, 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 and I still, I still see that, uh, in the barrio when I was helping out at Mafe, I still see a, a lot of folks that, that even though they're poor and, you know, are struggling, they still have those values inside. And that's why I've never kind of, kind of left. I mean, physically, I might have left, but my, you know, my heart is still there in my mind, too. So. That's great. That's great. So it sounds like um, the values that your father and, your, and the community itself, and, or in general, really was um, very powerful and it was a level of strength for you. Yeah, well, it, it taught me how to be a man, you know. At, at 19, I had to leave and, and go and, and be on my own, and, uh, and I had to be a man by, by then. I had to uh, do what a man does. I had to, to be strong. I had to uh, earn uh, right. that kind of thing. So. so the idea of machismo in the sense that you learned the proper ways of being a man, meaning that you took care of your family, you had to be strong in the sense yeah. of, of doing what was right for your family and other people. And it sounds like in the military, that would be an important value to hold. It was, it was. It really, it really helped me out because uh, uh, during during that time, um, we had the Vietnam War going on, you know. So, so it was really important that you had uh, a sense of value and, and respect. Uh, and that you were strong because you were in a hellacious situation over there, you know. And if you didn't have a, a good a good foundation inside, mm -hmm. you weren't going to make it. You know? mm -hmm. So I, it was kind of a lot of it. Uh, I learned, and a lot of it was just you know thrust on me, and uh, I was kind of forced to learn a lot of things over there. But I always, always. Uh, Wherever I was, it's just the same thing that drove me, you know? Mm -hmm. Be strong, be, be loyal, that sort of thing. My, my, my dad taught me. So would you say, and it sounds like you're saying, that the values of being strong and the respect really worked well when you were in the military. And, and it sounds like what I heard as well is, is that it, those values also helped you survive to some degree. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because uh, you, you had to... You had to uh, respect other people so they would respect you, and you needed that because we all depended on each other. You know, we were all trying to get out of help together, and uh, and as it turned out, uh, you know, I when I was growing up in the barrio, I didn't even know a lot of gringos, you know, mm -hmm. but in Vietnam, we we were all brothers because we had to be. Now, once we got out of Vietnam, we started separating again, you know, the gringos hung out over here, the rest of us over here. Mm -hmm. um, but in Vietnam, we had to, uh, we had to band together. So, yeah, it, it, uh, it helped me, those values helped me get along, and I, uh, I, I moved up through the ranks pretty, oh, really? pretty Can, well. Yeah. Um, I want to make another comment about the idea of family. So that idea of family and the strength of family and the commitment to family ended up really translating well to where you were in Vietnam, it sounds like, to have this band of brothers because that's what you, that you spoke yeah. about. So yeah. that, that value sort of worked well and, and I'm presuming really helped you again get through whatever that was. Yeah, well, what, what happened in Vietnam is if you did, if you did your, your job well and if, if you were able to survive, then, then you advanced and when you advanced, then, meant that you had more responsibility for other people. Oh, I see. So, so, you know, here you are, if you're a sergeant, you've got 12 to 15 guys underneath you, and you're responsible for mm -hmm. these guys. You know, one of them, one of them gets shot out in the jungle, and, it, and, and you carry that weight on your shoulders because he was in your squad. Oh, I see. So, yeah. 
I, I wasn't in the military. I only know very little about what that means. I certainly don't, wouldn't understand what it would be like to be in the military during a wartime. You know, during wartime. Can you, so can you tell me a little bit about what it meant to you to be in the military? Well, it, it, it was, uh, I, I was proud to, to be in the military because, like I said, you know, coming up in the bar, a lot of stuff was, was going on at that time. It still is. And a lot of uh, people my age wound up in jail or dead, you know. And, um, and I was happy that I was able to get out of there uh, kind of in an honorable way, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I didn't necessarily agree with the war over there, you know. I didn't start it, but, but my country said they needed me over there. And uh, I've accepted this country as mine, so I was proud to serve over there. And I had an opportunity to look after, you know, troops underneath me and what have you. And, and, and that's that's what a, that's what a man does. Mm. And uh, so I, I was I was proud to serve. That's very admirable. And it seems like um, the idea of machismo really also um, supported your 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 progress and your I guess survival in the military. As yeah, well, because it sounds like. That you know your commitment to your to the other men and your commitment to hard work and your you know, the value of those things really helped you move up in the ranks. It did. I did. I did fairly well. I did fairly well. And I, I was, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, um, in, in comparison with with uh, um, this, say the the, the, the Gringos over there in Vietnam. We, we really did have different values, you know. Hmm. They were kind of more personal. They looked out after, after themselves and not so much mm -hmm. after others, where, where I was kind of the opposite. And uh, they complained a lot. I didn't because, you know, I came up hard, you know. And so, uh, to me, it was just like another day at the office, but those guys over there were like just counting the hours, you know, till, till they could come back. So there was there was a difference, and that's why I, I, I think I was promoted over a lot of those guys. I see. To what degree were you promoted? I I went up. Uh, I did several tours. I did three tours, and and I uh, uh, when I got in country, I was a corporal, and then I quickly moved to sergeant, and then staff sergeant, and then sergeant first class, and then they gave me a chance to uh, to go to aviation school. Wow, wow. Um, they didn't have too much of a choice on the one hand because they, they were really short on pilots. Uh, but on the other hand, I was doing really good work over there. So they gave me, gave me an opportunity to come back stateside and go to school. And I got my, I got my wings. And wow. then they make me a warrant officer. By the time I left over there, I was a chief warrant officer. So the crazy guys at the, at the VA still call me chief, you know, but mm. that was a long time ago. Uh, I'm guessing that your aptitude had a lot to do with your ability to, to, to do those things and the values that you learned in the body and your family probably helped you get to where you got, I'm presuming. Yes, uh, all, all of that. And, and, and the other thing was that, um, the other thing was that that uh, one of the things that you had to conquer to survive in Viet Vietnam was fear, you know. Hmm. Because you were always scared over there. You never knew who was going to shoot at you. You know, you, the, the enemy you had over there, you couldn't see. Nobody could ever see those guys until they were right on top of you. Hmm. Uh, and uh, and a lot of, a lot of the, the guys that I worked with, they, they didn't make it because they, they were just too scared. Hmm. But in the bottom, if you're scared, you're not going to make it there either. Mm. So you know, I had two older brothers, and they taught me to to uh, to face. If I had a problem, they taught me to face it. And if that meant that I had to go toe to toe with so and so, that I, I did. I did what I had to do, and I did the same thing over in, in Vietnam. See. And so that helped me a lot because it, I kind of. I kind of focused on what I had to do, and that helped me forget about the fear for a little bit. I mean, I was scared, but I didn't. I, I didn't want to show. So one of the things that men don't do is 
or Hispanic men maybe, or men from the barrio, and specifically, is they don't show their fear. You, you don't show your fear, you don't show your weaknesses. Right. But it doesn't mean that you're not emotional, it doesn't mean that you're not fearful. Actually, you are. You're, you're fearful and you're emotional, but you, you don't show that because uh, once you do, then, then you, become, you become weak. And, and if you're weak, you know, if somebody's after you, they're going to get you. Right. I see. I see. So, um, the presence of weakness um, is an important thing for you in terms of how you identify yourself or how you see yourself. You don't yeah. want to be seen as weak. No. No. Never, never. Uh, so, do you think that people misinterpret that sometimes? That they see you maybe being hard or maybe being stoic or whatever, but it's really about the belief that you have related to your weak, not wanting to be seen as weak. Well, um, I think that's what's been happening to me lately. Is all of these things that there's a lot of things going on that I don't understand, and they they uh, they do make me seem weak. Okay. And that's why that's why I don't go to the, the the church meetings anymore. You know, with the guys over there, because those those guys those guys are strong. They, they the faith they have makes makes them strong, and that makes them successful. And and, uh, and they're admired by their family and their friends. And the way I feel, um, I. The way I feel, I, I don't want them to see me like this sweet. I'm, I'm not. I'm not myself. You know, and it, and it is because because I, I just don't. I don't feel strong anymore. So would you say that um, the thing that bothers you the most right now, or let me rephrase that. So what bothers you the most right now in terms of how you're feeling or what you'd like to change? Well, I guess what bothers me the most is um, is that I'm not myself. I kind of like to, to be my old self. And my old self, you know, even though I'm old and I've got these old wounds and everything hurts, um, uh, I felt strong. Okay. For, for, for this place and time, for my particular situation, I, I felt strong. But lately, uh, I don't. And I feel that... Uh, that people will look at me and they will think that, that they need to help me out and that, that I, I need to lean on them and what it is. So I, I, I don't even go to places I used to go because I don't want that to happen. So, so what you'd like to do is feel strong again. And that means uh, maybe one well, or two things you can tell me that what that means well, so I understand better. Yeah, right, right now it's like, it's, like, uh, it's, like, it's like I'm always tired. And I understand that a lot of that is because I'm getting old, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I know that if 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 I was to do something that that I, was important that was important to me, that would help me forget about that, and mm -hmm. and uh, and it would uh, it, it would help me get out of this this funk that I think I'm in, you know, but I, I can't find the, I can't find the, what do you, I guess, forgive my French, but I can't find the, the web mm -hmm. to do that I see. for right now, and I don't know why. I see. I see. Ever since, like I said, you know, I still felt that way when I had my, my dog. And, um, I sure felt that way when I had my wife. Sure, of course. But uh, right now, I don't have the desire to I see. I see. do much of it. So what have you done in the past to sort of get the webbles back, so to speak? Well, I, I, like I said, I used to do a lot of volunteer work. Okay. With the, the, I, I, I still belong to a Lions Club. Uh -huh. And uh, they also uh, were with me, when I, and then they helped me help out at the Barrio de la Fe. We did here in screenings, and we, we gave out food baskets at Christmas. Oh, wow. Admirable. We went out and we helped people paint their houses and, you know, do basic repairs at people's houses, even help them with their cars sometimes. Wow. That made me feel good, you know, that made sure. me feel like I was helping out, like I was what, was protecting some of these older folks that lived down there that, that, that needed a, a hand up. 
Um, same thing with the guys in the church. You know, somebody fell into some some bad times. We we were there to help with with whatever we could, whether it was money or or food or whatever. And when we couldn't do that, you know, we, we could at least you know pray for the guys. I see. So really, what it sounds like, you have been a very giving and very thoughtful person throughout your life, and it sounds like what's made you you know, get the webbles back or get feel back in line with how you were. It was really just helping people. Yeah. And it's what's interesting is is that the thing that you're the thing that helped you the most is the thing that you don't want to do right now. Because you're ashamed. That's my word. You didn't say that, but you feel like you don't have the strength to go, you know, be in front of those other of your friends and things because they don't you don't want them to see you as weak. Yeah. It, isn't that interesting? That you yeah. want to help and you're a good person, you've been You've done these amazing things. You're an admirable, honorable man. You've done, you know, you've served our country, and yet, you know, I would presume your friends and the people in church know that, right, to some degree or another. Totally. But yet, in your mind, kind of, you see yourself as weak, and you don't want to, you know, present that to the people. I'm guessing who care about you and respect you, and you know, and are concerned about you because you know the referral came from from them as well. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I, I kind of dug myself into a hole. Hmm. Yeah, I've been drinking a little too much, a little more than, than usual, and, and that that makes things even worse. You know, if I'm in a funk, then that makes it worse. But but uh, you know, that cold beer is always in the refrigerator, and you take a couple of those, and you and you think you start to feel better until it wears off. You know, that's, so that's, that's why I don't want people to see. Oh, I see. Okay, I, see. I don't want people to see. That uh, that I don't have everything under control, you know, and I don't feel like I have everything under control right now. I see. So. Um, I think it's really good insight that you see that the alcohol isn't going to be helping you, right? And the other part of that is is that you know it's probably not the best thing to do because you're right; it just covers up for a little while, and you know this. I don't think yeah. it's for sure. Yeah. Um, 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 but the thing is, is that as you as you think about what you would like to do to sort of move forward, you know, um, I think that you are you you've done very well in your life. You have a lot of strengths. You it seems like you've been very functional and you've been well actually very highly functional. So maybe it's about going back to the things that you used to do. Yeah, and the fact that you've lost your dog recently, it's pretty normal to feel the way you feel. You've lost your you know you lost your spouse. You know you're fe maybe feeling lonely is what I'm hearing a little bit. You're feeling sad about those you know the things that have happened in your life. And um, I don't see that as anything different than what most people would feel. So part of it is maybe seeing yourself in, in that light that a lot of people who would be in that situation would feel that way. So you don't have to sort of feel like you're not, feel like you're not normal, so to speak, you know, or that you have done something wrong or that you're less than, I guess. Yeah. You know, so like, is it possible to come maybe ease toward those things that you used to enjoy? Um, and, and it sounds like, given your given the things that have been important to you in your life, your family, your friend, you know, your, your camaraderie, that is it possible to maybe start easing back to the, the your the social groups, you know, going back to church a little bit, with the idea that, you know, you don't have to just rush into it, obviously. I mean, you need a little time to grieve and a little bit of time yeah. to feel sad. Yeah, I, I think I could do it, but but it would have to be, like you say, kind of a gradual thing. I don't think I can just walk into a big meeting of the brothers at church and say, you know, I'm back, sort of thing. I couldn't do that with the Lions either or with the people at La Fe. Sure, sure. But sure. I could, uh, what I could do is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, call a couple of the couple of the guys at the church group and uh, maybe uh, maybe talk to them and it just... Just start out doing doing small things, kind of start from from scratch. That is a great and, idea. Uh, and then maybe I can do the same thing with uh, with the lines. I'm sure those guys will be able to help me a lot. These guys have helped me a lot more over the years than the VA or sure. places like that. You know, those guys have their head up their butt. <laughs> the way I feel, I think a lot of people feel that way, unfortunately. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, I think I could kind of ease back. I couldn't do it just cold turkey like 
Yeah. Like just walk into a meeting and say that I'm back kind of thing. Exactly. And that seems very reasonable and it seems like a very smart idea. Um, um, and secondly, maybe just as a suggestion is, is that one of the things that we're feeling sad and we're, we're you know, when our appetite is low and that we're getting tired, you know, we really have to think it's important to think about like, you know, eating right, you know, you're, you're, you're a fit man, you've always been fit. So maybe getting back to that as well. You know, I know it's hard and it can be difficult, but you can see where not eating right, not being healthy can also exacerbate being tired. And that can sort of also lead into you not feeling like wanting to do stuff. So it's kind of like a vicious cycle. So one thing that you could potentially do is, you know, be thoughtful yeah. about eating those meals a little bit, maybe getting out a little bit, but you know, bit by bit, like you said, you can't just turn turn up you know turn the page and do everything the next day yeah i i, I used to hike up in the uh, in the mountains of the national park over there and i've been thinking about starting starting to do that again but then the way i feel i'm afraid i'm going to fall over there you know yeah. i would have have to get a little stronger before i did that well, and that's a great idea but maybe you could maybe just walk around a track or something yeah something you know ease in ease back into it and you'll see Hopefully you'll see that you know your energy will come back a little bit and with your support system with your with your brothers in the different clubs and having you know, moving into that I think will be will be useful too. Yeah. So so can we agree we'll you know we'll work towards that this week and um, next week we'll come back and kind of see how you're doing. Yeah, I can come back next week. I, right, I, I think I can uh, I can talk to you a lot better than you know the guys over at the VA. They, they, They've been trying to get me to talk for years, but I don't trust them. Right. That that means a lot that you that we've that. developed that trust. Yeah, I can do that. Fantastic. So um, same time next week, and um, we'll see you then. Sure. Yeah. Have That's a great good. great week, and you can call me if you have any questions. Well, thank you very much. So nice to meet you, Senor. Have a good day. Uh, culturally competent social work uh, in Spanish. After each session, we debrief. And um, in this case, we've used uh, a, a practicing therapist rather than a student, but we debrief so that we could recap some of the themes that we saw in the uh, interview and, and frame them for that student and for the rest of the students to see uh, what things that we learned from it and then also to coach and critique as needed. Um, for the purposes of this debriefing, we're going to talk about some of the things that the therapist did and that the, the client did that we, we found particularly illustrative of some of the principles that we're trying to develop for this module. Uh, most importantly, how the two engaged around cultural issues, because as we've been saying in this module, cultural issues uh, are matters of strength. They're sources of resilience. And when we work with a person, we always have to be cognizant of their context, not only as a member of an ethnic or cultural group, but as a member of other groups, families, uh, military organizations, professional occupations, and all the various forms of identity that each of us bring to the therapeutic relationship. But in this particular case, we're focusing in closely on the fact that we had a Hispanic uh, veteran uh, who identifies very strongly with his, his culture, and then that was being used by the therapist as a potential source of resilience and recovery for him, which all the evidence points to as being a very, very helpful uh, feature of treatment insofar as we draw on those things that gave us sustenance in the past, and we saw that his culture definitely gave him a great deal of sustenance in the past, and Sam, the, the therapist, Dr. Terrasas, was able to pull out of his past a great deal of significance around his identity as a Hispanic man. A couple of the things I'd like to talk about, uh, and we're going to do this as a panel so each of us has an opportunity to assess what we thought was important, uh, was that when they established rapport, the therapist took actually a fair a number amount of time, a fair number of minutes to do that. And you may have noticed that that is a, was a longer period of time than you see in a conventional uh, sort of Anglo-style um, assessment and intervention. For instance, um, it is very off-putting uh, to traditional Hispanic clients for a therapist to enter into the work phase immediately. Um, 
there is a tendency in my culture, I'm Anglo-Saxon um, uh, person who uh, would likely, in most interactions, quickly cut to the chase, as we say, get down to business. That's the style uh, of dominant American culture. In this particular case, uh, Sam took some time to get to know him, and he um, spent some time talking about him as a person, and I think uh, that opened up immediately uh, for uh, Alberto a sense of comfort, and that's really important in establishing the relationship. Um, he very briefly described the ground rules because of, as the intake worker had, had, had done that. Um, but as a clinician, then, he began to focus in on some of the client's losses. And he clarified that there had been a death of his spouse some years back. Um, he, he clarified that there was a, a death of his pet, uh, the client's pet, and, and he also talked uh, uh, with the client about the process of disengagement that he had been going through over the past few months. But at the same time, he was able to bring back uh, this to the individual's past and was evoking memories of when, when Alberto grew up in the Segundo Barrio, which is a, a traditional uh, low-income Mexican neighborhood. And it was there that he, the theme of familismo, or the focus on the importance of the family emerged because Alberto was talking about his mother's role in the home, he talked about his dad's role in the family, and how as a young man he was taught respect, loyalty, and the value of helping others. This was real important, I think, uh, in assessing this, this assessment uh, or this interview from that cultural point of view, because it moved on and segued well into the cultural attributes that he had as being very helpful to him in being resilient in the military. The loyalty, the sense of duty, the sense of being a proper man, uh, which could be framed as machismo, and again, we, ref we frame in this module machismo as a positive attribute, not as the violent sort of stereotype that some people have of machismo in Hispanic culture. And the therapist referred back to his cultural base. Why? Because he was going to lead the client, as you saw in the latter part of the interview, back to reconnecting with that as a potential source of strength in the future. So while he had disengaged uh, from uh, activities in his church and, and with the volunteer work that he was doing, he did recognize with the exploration that the therapist had done that these were very important sources uh, for him. From a clinical point of view, one of the things that Sam was able to focus in on uh, was the issue that Alberto felt weak. Uh, he, he was ashamed of feeling weak. Those were uh, the clinician's words, not his. But uh, to, in many respects, when he said, I don't feel strong, the client, and people will look at me and think they need to help me, that's a quote. This is a cultural code for depression. When uh, you talk with a Hispanic male who's traditional, they're not likely to tell you straightforwardly, I'm depressed because that is, in fact, a confession of weakness and is a confession that they're not wanting to feel comfortable with. So one of the ways in which depression is often expressed in Hispanic clients is somatization through stomach aches, through headaches, and saying, you know, I feel lethargic, and you did hear him say he felt lethargic, I don't have the energy that I used to have. But what he was getting at was that he is, he is depressed and he feels devalued. Um, and then as the interview went on, um, as we saw this was being set up very well, Sam began to talk about ways that he could reconnect through volunteering, because as a young man he had painted, how, or as a, as a retired man, he had painted houses in the Segundo Barrio, he'd fixed cars, he protected older folks who needed to hand up, as he said, and uh, this was framed by Sam as he was helping people. And we know that helping other people is also a very therapeutic activity. Um, he went on then to uh, begin to move toward closure by saying that it seemed like he didn't feel that he had everything under control. He seized on that when, when, when the client uh, noted that. And he also reaffirmed in the client his observation that the client knew he was drinking too much and that this wasn't solving the problem. It was only giving a short-term relief 
Uh, and so he recognized that the client had that kind of insight. And he also normalized the process of grief. Grief is a natural and normal process of life. And especially when you lose a, a, a life companion, uh, whether, whether it's your, your pet or most importantly, if it's your spouse, we need to let people know that these kinds of responses and grief reactions are normal. And Sam let him know that these were normal responses. But then he brought it back to the issue of how he might ease back into some of the social institutions and cultural institutions that had sustained it. A couple of themes that I'd like to conclude with are familismo. The value of family to this particular person was huge. It framed everything about him, and now he has no life. He has no immediate family. He's living alone. Even his pet is gone. So imagine the sea of isolation that he is swimming in in the absence of having the fundamental cultural institution that formed him and sustained him through life. Another is respeto, or respect. His concern about respeto is he doesn't want to appear to feel weak because he respects himself, he expects others to respect him, and he can't do this if his loss of orgullo or pride, and, there, and, and that threatens his traditional view of the, the male role, his fear of, of, of being seen as weak. Um, so I, I think that uh, one of the final statements that, that uh, uh, I could make about this is that this is a really good representation of how you can connect a person to their cultural identity at the same time, connect them with their cultural uh, groups that can sustain them through the process of recovering from loss. Because it seems in this particular client that the PTSD is probably fairly latent. We didn't see any references to anger or road rage or hyperarousal or the sorts of things we see with PTSD. So this is really uh, probably a fairly normal reaction to grief and loss, and Sam framed it very well. What, what would you like to say in retrospect, having, having looked back at that interview? Um, I think what was really important in that interview was the idea that, like you were talking about earlier, that men, are, Hispanic men, are not going to want to, sort of, to divulge their weakness, and depression would certainly be that way. Um, there's stigma around mental illnesses, you know, as we know across many populations and many groups, but for Hispanic men, they're, because of this idea of wanting to be strong and this idea of machismo, they're not going to want to come into a therapist and say, I'm depressed. So you have to be very careful in how you frame that kind of language, but also in how you differentially diagnose using the idea of culture as a way to understand the language that they use to sort of explain symptomology. So um, I think that was really important. And, um, um, and beyond that is, is that the idea of engaging the client and where he's at and, the, and know that if you don't engage and if there isn't that respect and that understanding and cultural awareness, you're going to struggle to get that client back in for another session. And, um, and our in, in this case, Alberto said that I trust you and I can talk to you better. And he spoke very specifically in saying that, well, those people, the VA, I don't really trust them or whatever. And um, that's not a dig on the VA. It's probably more about it, it, speaking to the, the importance of cultural competency and work with Hispanic men in general. Good. Dr. Chavez? Well, I, I just want to add the importance about to perform a deep interview about the migration because the reasons of the migrations also are um, um, are going to lead you about how the persons behave and how the persons can resolve the issues that happen in their lives. In this case, then, you would suggest that uh, Sam have perhaps added some uh, questions or probed a little bit about Hit the migration experience because we know the migration experience is a significant factor in, in, in becoming an American and leaving a, another identity and he seemed to hold on very strongly to his Mexican identity uh, but what, what kinds of things would you and, have asked? And, and also the reasons of the migration if, if they reason because the violence mm -hmm. of the, if they reason uh, if they migrate to the U.S. because of the violence, right. or if they migrate because they are looking for this American dream, or because they were looking for 
being the family. Right. I think that's an important point because one of the things that's lost in the current debate um, about migration is the failure to recognize um, that people migrate here um, primarily for economic reasons and often in, in, are actually returning back to their country of origin um, and identify strongly with their Mexican identity. But, but the other is that there's a recent wave of migrants that's coming to the United States over the past seven to eight years who have been profoundly traumatized by the war on drugs in that country and by the rise of organized crime there. So we want to be checking with that with, with any type of a, a, a migrant. Um, is there anything you'd like to add in conclusion, Sam? Yeah, the, the final thing that really relates to the migration part is, is that um, if folks migrate here because they feel like they're being forced, then the process of acculturation becomes much more complicated. And if they have children, that makes it much more complicated. So the likelihood or the probability that psychosocial sort of problems will sort of be much more prevalent with those populations versus someone who migrates because they have, they've got a great job and they're very excited about it. So the, the acculturation process will be much different. So that's what the importance, I think, the secondary importance Dr. Chavez spoke about of, of assessing the migration process. Very good. Well, we hope this has been useful in understanding the, the source of strength that being a member of a cultural group can bring to the therapeutic and healing.